Hello, everyone, and welcome to Attitude Magazine's ADHD Experts Broadcast. We are pleased to have Susan and Paul Yellen here to talk with us about how to get your child ready to tackle the new post-pandemic school year in August, September, or wherever you live. Before we get started, let me note a couple of housekeeping items. Those of you tuned into the live webinar may download the slides now by clicking on the event resources section of your webinar screen. And if you're interested in the certificate of attendance option, look for instructions in the email you'll receive around an hour after the live broadcast. For those of you listening in replay or podcast mode, you can visit attitudemag.com and search podcast 363 to access the slides, the webinar replay, and the certificate of attendance option. And if you support the work we're doing here at Attitude to strengthen the ADHD community, we encourage you to visit attitudemag.com slash subscribe and sign up for Attitude Magazine for your family or to share with a teacher or a loved one who could benefit from greater understanding of ADHD. And finally, the sponsor of this week's Attitude webinar is Brain Balance. Brain Balance is a holistic cognitive development program designed to help kids and teens with ADHD and beyond improve focus, attention, and behavior. Brain Balance creates a customized plan based on your child's needs to support their social, emotional, and academic growth. An exploratory study with Harvard's McLean Hospital found the Brain Balance program to be as effective as low-dose stimulant medication in alleviating ADH symptoms in children. For more information, visit brainbalance.com to learn about, the brain balance, about brain balance today. Attitude thanks our sponsors for supporting our webinars. Sponsorship has no influence on speaker selection or webinar content. Now for today's topic, getting your child off to a great start in this post-pandemic school year. Parents know all too well that the past year was tough, confusing, and emotionally draining for students and their parents. Pandemic learning arrangements tripped up and in some cases halted kids' progress in school. A year and a half after mastering Zoom, many students will return to school in the fall with a more typical in-person schedule. What can and should parents do to help their children recoup the learning losses of the past year and prepare for the new school year? What are some of the most effective ways to make this coming school year more productive and positive for your student? Susan and Paul will discuss and provide answers to all of these questions. Susan is the Director of Advo Advocacy and Transition Services at the Yellen Center for Mind, Brain, and Education, an innovative learning support and diagnostic practice in New York City. She co-authored the award-winning book, Life After High School, a guide for students with disabilities and their families, and was the founding director of the Center for Learning Differences, a nonprofit dedicated to helping families dealing with learning and attention difficulties find resources in their communities. Paul is the director, the director of the Yellen Center for Mind, Brain, and Education in New York City. He has dedicated his entire career to improving the well-being and development of young people. Dr. Yellen is an associate professor of pediatrics at New York University School of Medicine, Department of Pediatrics, where he serves as a member of the faculty of the program in developmental behavior, behavioral pediatrics. You can ask questions of both Susan and Paul during their presentation, and we will try to get to as many of them as we can after they are done. With all that being said, I'll turn it over to Susan and Paul. And thanks, thanks so much for being here. Thank you, Wayne, and welcome. As Wayne said, it's been quite a period of time for everybody, parents and children. And having this summer preceding a school year where many of the students that you lo know and love will be going to school full time, transitioning back to in-person learning, is a good time for everybody first to enjoy the activities of opening up. Whether your family engages in recreation as a family or the kids get involved in their own sports, whether there's travel, family gatherings involved, time with people outside of your, you know, your pandemic pods is only gonna help your children strengthen their skills in socialization 
and make them feel that a more normal fall is coming. The things that families can do really fall into two categories as they look forward to the school year. Some are strictly parent activities and some involve parents and children together. So let's start while the kids are having fun and enjoying the recreation of summer. Let's start with what parents can do now to prepare for the new school year. First of all, if your child has a 504 or an IEP, you should pull that out, read it through, which you should do every school year anyway, and think about whether the services or the accommodations set out in the IEP or 504 plan were provided during the pandemic learning time. Were goals met? Were goals even tried to be met? Was progress made? Think about what can be put in place in the fall to help your child make up for what he or she might have missed last year. Think also about changes you might need to make to the IEP or 504 plan. You might want to start by understanding what kind of learning paradigm is going to be in place in your child's school in the fall. Is the school returning to or even continuing full-time in-class learning? Will there still be an online component or will there be some combination of those two? Because how the IEP in 504 is implemented can vary depending on where and how your child is learning. You should be aware that you have the right to seek an IEP meeting or a 504 meeting at any time, even over the summer. It's a little tougher to schedule. The personnel are not as easily present, but that right is yours. In fact, if you simply need to make a small change to an IEP, there's a provision in the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, which is the law that creates the IEP, that says you don't necessarily have to even have a meeting. If you want to increase, for example, the frequency of the service from once a week to maybe twice or three times a week to help make up for what's been rough for your kid, that's fine. You can reach out if the school agrees. That can just be done in an exchange of written documents. So it, you may not even need a meeting to make changes. Consider also compensatory services. These are extra sessions or specialized instruction over and above what your child would ordinarily get that are designed to make up for issues or problems with the services and supports that they received. Think about whether there are social and emotional concerns arising from online learning and just the whole difficulty of the pandemic and perhaps what families faced. Are children in need of services that address their social and emotional needs? that might not have been necessary in the past. So those are all things that you might want to think about as you approach your IEP or 504. I think the start of the next school year, as every school year, but this one in particular, gives you an opportunity to revisit and optimize your child's medication management if your child is on medication. Um, do you have a medication diary? If you don't have one, it's, it might be helpful to start one uh, to keep track of what medications your child is on and, and how he or she are doing. Uh, just to remind ourselves of what optimal follow-up and management of ADHD medications should be, um, should include at least every three month visits to monitor height, weight, heart rate, blood pressure, and physical examination uh, with checklists or other information from parents and teachers reviewing symptoms and side effects, as well as other relevant information. Uh, we've all had to modify what we do and much of ADHD medication follow-up, I know in my practice has been virtual and uh, families have had to uh, go to local physicians or measure heights at home. Uh, so sort of getting back to being in touch. Uh, and also, uh, a lot of parents have said, well, my teachers don't know uh, how my child is doing. The checklists are not going to be too valuable, um, but there are opportunities to, to, to catch up. Um, as they're away at camp, I just was on uh, a, a telemedicine visit with a child, his parents, and the counselor at camp. Uh, and the camp is keeping track of nutrition and weight and height uh, as the as the summer winds down, because I think that you need to have two thoughts in mind. One is how are you going to begin the academic year? 
and make sure that you touch base with um, whoever is managing your child's medication uh, so that you have a sense of are you going to have a visit right before school starts and how are you going to begin the year. But bear in mind that next year is going to be different. And so it's important to think about how are you going to check back in and how will you start to collect some information about how your child is doing? Do you want the teachers to fill out checklists after the first four or five weeks and, and, and check back in to see how things are in, in the dynamic of the new school year? Continuing on with what parents can do before we get to the second part of this presentation, parents have had a unique opportunity in many instances to observe how their children learn. They've watched how Zoom works. They've heard their child respond to a teacher. They've seen how the teachers teach and how all of this goes on in a way that they might not have had a chance to do before. So it would be a good time for parents to engage in a subject-by-subject -subject review based on their own observations and some gentle inquiries with their child. What classes went well last year? What subjects were a problem? Was the instruction offered last year effective? Not at all, greatly, or maybe partly? And if so, what worked? And is your child ready to do the work that he or she will encounter in the fall? And that helps us segue to going beyond parent tasks, because once you reviewed your child's IEP and 504 plan, considered how their medication is doing and checked in with their physician, thought about last year's subjects and considering this coming year's subjects, there are steps that you can take together with your child. These can help your child build the skills to start the new year. But one proviso here, it's important that whatever you're doing in terms of skills building is something your child finds enjoyable, rather just more of in-home schooling with the sense of disconnection and work, work, work. Summer should be fun and fun is important for kids. And there are ways to blend these things that will make them both useful and enjoyable. Now, front-loading content in vulnerable areas is another useful thing you can do over the summer. I, but you want to be strategic. Um, building on Susan's point, I think it is really important. Our kids need normalcy. They need a break. Um, we can't feverishly be trying to make up for lost time. Uh, but uh, there's always a benefit in having some previewing of of upcoming information. Front loading is kind of like building files in your child's mind to facilitate engagement with and retrieval of information. Think about what it's like when you go to a lecture or go to a movie or go someplace where you know something about the topic at hand. It makes it much more interesting and much easier for you to stay focused. Children with ADHD in particular uh, need to have that kind of activation uh, of material so that they're going into class and it's not too much novel material uh, so that they are able to focus and make connections. Oh yeah, I, that reminds me of what I talked about with, with dad. That's what I talked about with mom. That's what I talked about with my, with my cousin. Uh, and, and sort of building those files can be really, really helpful. Uh, and we're not talking about uh, redoing or previewing the entire content but things like Khan Academy, which is free, has lots of different academic subjects. A brain Pop is not free, but it has little YouTube videos, like five to 10 minute videos about different subjects. So the idea of giving your child a flavor for what's coming up. Um, another benefit of previewing some of the content is that we're all approaching the coming year with some anxiety and trepidation. And the best way to feel less anxious is to know what's coming up or to go into class having a sense, oh, that's what we're going to talk about on day one. I already know something about that subject matter. Um, Nucella is a wonderful resource. Um, uh, a few months back, uh, there was a champion on, on uh, Jeopardy named James Holzhauer who broke all the records on that show, or most of the records, and they asked him how he built up his fund of knowledge, and he said he used to go to the children's section of the library and read lower-level 
books about content. And for our kids who are struggling with attention or maybe struggling with reading challenges, looking at academic content or looking at subject matter presented in simpler language can be really helpful. And Usela is a site where you can look at the most um, sophisticated vocabulary and then dial it down so that you're getting some background knowledge. Uh, another in interesting tool is something called Snap and Read. Uh, and what this does is it actually allows kids to see the entire text, but have more accessible vocabulary for some of the denser, maybe arcane, out of date vocabulary. Uh, so previewing a book that the vocabulary might be daunting for your child with something like Snap and Read to it, it highlights the more difficult words. It doesn't summarize, um, and with a click, it goes back to the original text, and it interfaces with with Google Chrome and has the uh, gives you the ability to access lots of different text. Um, so the idea of sort of giving your child a little bit of a heads up of what's coming uh, to build some prior knowledge to eliminate some of the anxiety uh, and prep their brain for being engaged when this when the school year begins. Related to front-loading material is cultivating areas of strength, talent, and affinity. Focus with your child on subjects and activities that your child enjoys and feels good about. Keeping in mind the specific curriculum for their upcoming grade, what kind of science, what kind of history. Does your child enjoy sports, art, drama, music, or something else? Using these areas of enjoyment and skill is a great sort of running start to getting more involved in material that can be useful in the fall. So how do you do this? How do you use affinities to build skills? There's a long list, but some of these things would be, for example, take a family trip to a science museum. Is your child gonna be studying astronomy? Maybe make it a, a planetarium. Visit a local historical site. Your child can interview an older relative or a friend. Take a trip to the library. They usually have summer book clubs and it's probably not too late to join. They can also create their own books or newspaper or even a comic with text and artwork. There's a, what is the site? Um, comic Creator. You should be able to find that online. There are others that enable children, especially those who don't like to write long amounts of text, to tell a story in an effective way. They can also work on math skills in a lot of fun ways. They can keep score at a baseball game. They can use math when baking and cooking, especially fractions. They can help the family budget for outings or even plot the route of a trip. They can create an art show for your family or even the whole neighborhood. And putting on a play or musical, an original production is a lot of fun with costumes and other kids, the skills that's in, that are involved in that are really substantial. These kinds of things can help by building, building organizational, what we call executive function skills, math, reading, writing. They can help students front load subjects, as Paul was speaking about, like history and science. And they don't feel like school or work. Again, getting back to the very first points we were making, that children need normalcy, they need fun, they need the sense of a good summer. And kids can progress at their own pace and set their own agenda. Another area to think about are whether or not there are areas of challenge that you might want to address prior to the academic year. Are there vulnerabilities uh, that you've seen in the past? Are there gaps in skills in certain areas uh, that you want to address before the school year begins. Uh, things like gaps in math. The math, you know, math is such a cumulative subject that uh, beginning the year caught up with the information that is gonna be the starting point can be really important. Is your child moving into uh, middle school? Are there time management skills that you need to be thinking about? Are you concerned uh, about your child uh, taking notes in class because they zone out in the middle of, of, of class? Uh, does your child tend to gloss over while reading text and miss important details? 
what kind of resources can you uh, either be starting to work on to close gaps or tools that you might want to have at your fingertips when the year begins uh, to just sort of pull off the shelf when you need it. Um, lots of kids with um, are struggling, you know, an important part of math is, is having their, their number facts automatic. Uh, and this is a, one of my favorite books. It's, it's called Times Tables, The Fun Way. Uh, it is not free. Um, it's not um, expensive. I don't obviously it's a relative question. But the stories are these very goofy stories about different math facts. So, for example, the story for six times six is, is 36 uh, is two twin brothers who are the sixes. Uh, they're in the desert uh, so that they're thirsty. So six um, times six is 36. There's also an edition version of that same book. Um, you know, Dreambox Learning uh, is another resource uh, that uh, has, uh, it, it is basically, once again, it is not free. Um, it's sort of like games. Uh, it's, an, it's an adaptive software program that kids feel like they're playing different kinds of games, but what it is doing is closing gaps in foundational math skills. Uh, up, uh, IXL is another resource, uh, a little bit, uh, it goes even to higher levels, uh, a little bit more like work, um, but sort of playing around is another resource to sort of close gaps in math procedures. Um, this is a free resource called Bedtime Math, which is just quick, wacky bedtime stories uh, for dinner time, bath time, anytime. Uh, you see the link there. Uh, that is another way to just play around with math that you don't want to get your child working on those other uh, tools, but you want them to have an opportunity to, to play math games. Um, this is a chart. Uh, I hope it projects well. What the way I, I want to lay out is this is a, this is a tool um, and for working on time management skills. One of the things that I think we typically do with kids who have attention deficit or anybody is giving them long vertical to-do lists. And what we found in our practice is having a horizontal to-do list with um, a timeline uh, and a dry erase board works extremely well for this, where you can sort of cross hatch it and, I, and sort of lay out uh, the interval of time and proportionally identify how much time each activity will take, helping your kids understand as they allocate their time how long things take and start to build their time management skills. Um, Audiobooks, the, um, particularly, you know, often uh, one can have free or very inexpensive access to these two uh, audiobook resources. Um, these days, uh, Learning Ally tends to be less um, robotic in the voices. Um, Bookshare is free, I believe. They both have the ability to sync up with uh, a tablet or, or a Kindle so that your child can be looking at the words. The words are getting highlighted while they're hearing them. And so it's helping our kids who might tend to read too quickly, might tend to gloss over words, stay with the subject matter. Um, not every teacher is gonna allow what I'm about to describe. Um, we've used this with medical students and college students, but it's a smart pen that records, digitizes, and places on your child's tablet or computer while the teacher is teaching and so that a child can make a note. Um, you know, kids that I see in my office will say, you know, the teacher is telling us 10 of the most important things I wrote. I look at my notes, I have one, two, three, and the next thing I know, she's talking about nine. I don't know what happened to the time in between. Um, and so some of these recording devices, if they're allowed in the classroom for our kids, allow them to uh, recapture what they lost. And unlike recording the whole lecture, it allows you to pinpoint the place where you missed something and, and play it back. Um, Notability is another resource like that. I mean, this is a link to Notability. Once again, these are not free, uh, but they're powerful resources that allow kids to, um, to capture uh, what they miss if they're zoning out in class. Um, a couple of other resources that I just want to mention to have at your fingertips. Um, actually, one more is something called CoWriter, uh, which is a great resource. It is not free, once again, um, 
and it's become incredibly uh, uh, sophisticated over the years uh, in that it has gotten, um, especially if our kids are having trouble finding their words or if they tend to overuse the same vocabulary, uh, it will. it's a word prediction software that, that actually uh, pulls from vocabulary that is specific to the grade level and the topic at hand. So knowing what those resources are could be helpful. Paul is mentioning these, but note that the reason he's listing them is because he uses them with the students with whom he works. These are, unfortunately, we don't own any of them. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> we get nothing from this, but these are the things that the students in our clinic find helpful. And I think just thinking about what resources have been helpful um, in the past or, or, you know, just even having them at your fingertips um, to think about, not necessarily to start the year with. I want to talk about mindset. A book that uh, that I love is is um, so Carol Dweck is a psychologist, and what she identified is the notion that we can think of people in terms of two kinds of mindsets: a fixed mindset and a growth mindset. And uh, you know, a, a big clue when somebody comes into our office for an evaluation um, is if they have a fixed a mindset. Is if they say. Um, you can tell me what my IQ is. I want you to know what my IQ. I want to know what my IQ is. Um, and you know, um, Alfred Binet, who invented the IQ test, never believed that the uh, IQ, that the human intelligence, was fixed or that it was uh, finite or that it said really set the ceiling to where our brains could go. We understand that intelligence is fluid; that our brains change and grow through our whole lives. And what. Um, Carol and what those of us in the field have talked increasingly about is helping our children move from a fixed to a growth mindset. A fixed mindset would be that your potential is driven by the hand you were dealt. Each success validates your abilities and each failure threatens them. Um, and people with a fixed mindset tend to avoid things that they're not good at because it tends to, if I can't do it, then I don't want to find out I can't do it because that's going to make me feel really badly. A uh, growth mindset is the difference between I can't do it and I can't do it yet. Um, it's easy. It's easy for me. Uh, growth mindset indicates that basic qualities can be cultivated through your efforts. A person's true potential is unknown and unknowable. It's impossible to foresee what can be accomplished with years of passion, toil, and training. And uh, this is a busy slide. It's going to be part of the packet. But it talks about some of the differences between a fixed and a growth mindset uh, and I, I think, you know, as we're thinking about our children's athletic activities, um, I, I think that athletics is a wonderful way to think about a growth or a fixed mindset. Uh, I remember one of the a few years back, I was talking to a potential patient's parents, um, and the mother was a, was a tennis coach. Um, and I use the analogy that, uh, you know, that athletes understand the way we think about brains the best, because... You can be the greatest in your sport, but that doesn't mean every aspect of your sport is strong. That we all have strengths and challenges. That we're, that's just part of the human condition. And she pointed out to me that, that um, I don't know if this is true because I'm not a tennis expert, but she said to me, you know, Rafael Nadal, who has been number one at, at, in the world for good chunks of the of our life, recent lives, uh, is known to not have a great backhand. Uh, that his forehand is his strength. And if somebody said to him, you have a backhand disability, you better spend all your time working on your backhand, that wouldn't be too helpful to him. But he, what she said is that he hits 80% fewer backhands than the opposition. He knows, given a choice, his forehand's going to be his winning stroke. The point is helping our kids understand that brains are like that, that ADHD is a diagnosis. But um, even within those framework of ADHD or whatever your child's diagnosis is, understanding that your child has lots of strengths and many, many, many more strengths than challenges. And that even within the context of ADHD, attention is a multifaceted function and not every part of attention is going to be a challenge for your child. So thinking in terms of not just what your child's challenges are, but where their strengths are and normalizing the fact that we all have both um, and, you know, moving that, that set of I learn differently too. We all learn differently and we all have different learning needs. And your child's uh, advantage is going to be that they have a leg up because they understand how they, how they learn best. Don't want to lose the opportunity to, to, and, you know, talking about feelings is a personal thing. And it's all of us have different feelings about talking about it and 
really different philosophies, uh, different relationships with our children, but understand that we all have lots of feelings about this past year uh, and, and that, um, that we all are going through something extremely meaningful, traumatic, um, th that has really changed our perspective. Children who uh, uh, you know, were preteens, who were about to um, move from being close to the nest to exploring out in the world, uh, suddenly got the message that the world is dangerous in ways that they've never considered before. So sort of thinking about that um, it is important and thinking about the fact that as our kids go back to school, um, there may be some anxieties, uh, especially if they haven't been vaccinated, especially if, you know, there are different feelings in your home about about the whole philosophy about how to approach these things. Um, it's important to talk about these things. They're, 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 they're really affecting all of us and sort of taking time to think about what I'm looking forward to for the coming year, what I'm excited about, what I'm worried about, uh, because it's an adjustment. It's a change from where we were. Uh, when, uh, somebody who went to teach, taught me psychology once said, remember, on some level, all change is loss. And so we're moving from a year where things were really different to a year where things are going to go back to normal, um, hopefully more and more. Um, so talking about that is, is, is going to be important. Um, finally, we're going to leave you with some conclusions and then leave time for questions. Basically, as you're getting your child, as you and your child are getting ready for your child to go back to school in a more normal paradigm, We've tried to go over some of the things that are helpful to do. Tools you can use, ways to approach getting back to school, parental tasks like re reviewing your child's IEP or 504, or thinking about the coursework, family activities that can build skills and help your child feel more confident going into the year. Note, as Paul just said, no change is easy. And there's going to be a big transition for families. Um, you know, a lot of adults are kind of nervous about going back to their office. Some of us are balking at it. <laughs> but the fact remains that we hope that we've been helpful to you in putting some of these possible tools in your hands and skills in your hands to help you and your child when schools reopen in late August or in September. Paul. I, want, I want to put another thought out there. We keep talking about the lost year and what kids have lost. I want to posit something completely different and say this was not a lost year. Uh, I remember a few years back, we had a visit in our office um, from a group of women who were affiliated with the United Nations. And one of the women from New Zealand was telling me about one of the indigenous tribes um, and a bunch of the boys were having trouble learning math. Um, they spent a week or two out hunting with their fathers and they came back with a greater appreciation of math than they could have gotten in the classroom. What happened this year is not anything we would have planned for or wished for, but whatever experience your child had, your child's learned about himself or herself, about themselves as a learner, what has gone well, what hasn't gone well. They've benefited in some ways by being with you. You've had had a perfect experience recently where um, a child had been referred to us for what appeared to be attention deficit challenges. Um, and after watching the child learn remotely, uh, the parent turned to me and she said, you know, I don't think it's attention so much as he doesn't understand what the teacher's talking about. Uh, and that there were subtle language challenges that only mom or dad picked up at home. The point is that this year, um, you can't make up for the year and you, you don't have to. I think that we've made gains, we've lost some things, but the key is, I think, to step back and go forward with a game plan to make the coming year a, as positive as we can, which is which should be the case for every year. Uh, and once again, my, my parting thought is, I don't think this was a lost year. Uh, and I know not everybody will agree with me, but it, this was not a lost year. Uh, so we can stop now for- Yeah, questions. questions. Hmm. Thank you. Yeah, that was great. That was great, guys, really good, um, and lots of good questions. Uh, one attendee is grateful for all the incredible resources, and her problem is that there is only so much time in a day. My daughter, who's 12 years old, has camp from 9 to 3. 
how do you suggest that we fit some of these wonderful activities into the day without overwhelming her? I, I, you go ahead. Uh, you know, I, I think that I, I would I would sort of follow my child's lead. Um, you know, the question becomes is even thinking about not doing any of those things for the first chunk of time while your child is home from camp? Or, you know, do you want to read a group, a book together as a family or do baking together? Um, you know, things, I, I would focus on some of those non-academic kinds of things that can be fun to do together. Um, you know, Susan pointed out, uh, but uh, just to underscore how kids are um, with attention deficit typically have difficulty with time management. Um, having them plan, you know, an outing, a family outing where their job is to think of the mileage and think of what time they need to leave and when do they need to get ready in the morning and what, how do they have to budget. Those kinds of things that are really empowering and skills building, but don't feel like school, I think, are where I would put my energy. And, and you know, I can't tell you how many times um, we forget to ask kids what they want to do and so you know offering some opportunities and some choices but don't make it sound like more school and you know and and of course uh we don't want them to feel like oh we're punishing them again um because now that they lost the school year they're going to have to lose the summer too so i i think keeping it as natural um as fun as empowering and as real life connected as you can, I think is where I would put my energy. Some of these tools you may just want to file away until later in the school year. Mm -hmm. uh, my child doesn't have an IEP or 504. Where do I start? And can they start now, for instance, during the summer when school's out? I, I, you know, absolutely. We have been having, uh, you know, I, I think that um, well, I'm going to defer to Susan because, uh, you know, the, the, the I, I was going to say, but I've, I'm, she will tell you what you need to do to get the ball rolling. And yes, you can do it over the summer. I'm assuming that the question relates to a parent who believes their child needs an IEP or a 504 plan. Yes, and in yes, order to start so. that process, that process always starts with an evaluation of your child's learning. The school will okay. do that evaluation for you at no cost. There are places that will do it for you at a cost, like us. Um, but the fact remains, you first start with an evaluation. Once the school has seen this evaluation, which looks at how your, your child's levels of learning and function in different areas, then the, that sort of poses, the sets the table for it. Then the school district can say, we don't believe your child does need something. Or they can say, yes, we see there's a deficit in reading and we can try to ameliorate that by having your child work with a reading specialist, that sort of thing. So whether it's a 504 or an IEP, and, and we could do 10 webinars on the differences and, and rules about those, um, the fact remains that you should start by having your child evaluated. You might want to go to your pediatrician if you're interested in seeing what resources are in your community for uh, recommendations, or start with your school. And the, the magic words are, I believe my child has a learning challenge or an attention challenge, and I want to seek either, you may decide, you could do some reading as to which is the best route to start, but you, I believe my child needs an IEP, or I believe my child needs a 504 plan. Consider this a formal request. You should know that for an IEP, a formal request must be made in writing. And there are loads of rules and regulations and timing, but don't let them brush you off. Just be quietly persistent. And we'll do another webinar another day as to how to get started. Yeah, I mean, another thing you know that's been even more prevalent in light of the pandemic are schools that have done inadequate assessments. Uh, and so we've seen a lot of families who, for whom they've been told their child does not need an IEP or the IEPs have been inadequate. And the district has done a very cursory evaluation and, uh, and there's, and some districts can, can be in, um, will pay for an independent evaluation. Uh, and we've seen, we've been doing a good number of independent evaluations this summer for school districts. Um, because they've been unable to do, they know they can't do it they've been unable to do in person um, 
evaluations or they've been unable to keep up. Um, you know, we were all set to do uh, remote assessments. We've been doing in-office assessments since June, uh, and there are ways to do it safely. Uh, and so I think that you may find that your district said your child doesn't qualify, uh, but that the assessment may have been cursory or inadequate, and you do have an opportunity to, to have another evaluation. Mm -hmm. uh, another parent is asking, any advice for how to approach collaboration with a new teacher as the school, new school year begins? I, I think that um, I would be just direct and reach out and, you know, and, and find out what's the best way to contact next year's teacher, how does he or she like to be, you know, contacted, um, and set a meeting. Sense, can, can we have an early meeting? Um, the teachers I'm speaking to are as uneasy about the coming year and are eager to get to know families and, you know, especially if you're approaching them as a helpful resource that you want to make sure that you are doing at home what you need to do to support your child's start to the year. Uh, you want to make sure uh, that you understand what's important to him or her, what's the best way to communicate. Collaboration. Collaboration, yeah. I think, you know, people, you know, I, 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 the teachers that I've been speaking to are, are also feeling lonely and feeling isolated. And I think the opportunity, I think they will welcome any kind of outreach uh, for genuine collaboration. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, some parents have talked about um, sort of introducing their kid without bringing to the teacher by either doing a a video of their child or doing a story about their child, uh, talking about his strengths or her strengths and weaknesses. So um, the teacher gets a little better idea of what, of who the child is. Do you recommend that or? I, you know, I, I, my, so take this as my opinion, um, you know, different people may disagree. That may feel like a little too much, especially, you know, it's the same, you know, it's especially um, I think uh, maybe give your teacher a chance to get to know your child, you know, reach out. If mm -hmm. you do have such a, you know, such a, you know, a presentation, um, it may be after that she's gotten to know your child for a couple of weeks and say, you know, we came up with this, you know, and, and I would sort of be humorous about it and say, look, it might be, you know, a little too much, um, but we thought you'd, you'd get a kick out of it when they already have context with your child. But I think sort of that mm -hmm. I think it will be overwhelming, and and I think it could be off-putting. Um, yeah, I feel even more strongly that that's I, I understand as a parent how important it is that the teacher get your child and understand what's going on with your child, but. Um, as a child of a teacher and the mother of a teacher, I have to tell you that I do think that the teacher would be offended by that. So, you know, it, but it's, you never know. I, you don't know every teacher. You don't know every, how this would be done by a parent. It's possible it could be helpful, but my guess would be to hold off. And, you know, you may benefit, you know, the other perspective is that your child is being looked at by fresh eyes this coming academic year. Um, and, you know, teachers have a lot of experience. Obviously, they're different, different levels of experience. But not every teacher is going to get your child. Um, but, you know, un unless there's something pressing that you're really concerned is going to go awry quickly if you don't head it off, um, you may benefit by letting the teacher have a fresh look and, and seeing what the teacher sees and then, you know, deciding uh, what you share and how you share it. Uh, but... Look, everybody has their own style of interacting and relationship building. Uh, you heard our opinion. Um, yeah, which is, yeah, mm -hmm. so, yeah. Just that, our opinion. Our opinion. Okay, several parents have asked about um, emotions and behavior getting in the way of learning in school. One woman, mother, writes, sometimes uh, my son's behavior, well, he doesn't, she doesn't say it. The child's behavior becomes explosive in school. Any resources, documents, or approaches I can take to control the behavior in the classroom because it's getting in the way of the child's learning. So, you know, the, um, I, I think it's important to step back and think of behavior as any other symptom. Um, and, and then, you know, and, and the, the behavior, the, the, the behavior 
uh, you know, requires some investigation as to what what is the cause of it. And I think the behavior, you know, should spark an, a, a, some kind of a diagnostic evaluation. And is the child acting out because the child, uh, you know, ha has a primary, you know, a, a, problems with, re with a regulation of emotion? Is it a symptom of attention deficit? Is that child frustrated? Is that child feeling unsafe? Uh, so I wouldn't start with how do I, you know, I'll, I'll tell you a story that, that that is one of my favorite stories of a, a kid that got sent to my office um, because they wanted him on ADHD medication because he was calling out in school all the time. Uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I, he walked into my office, he's about nine, and I said, do you know why you're here? And he goes, yeah, I call out, of, call out in school all the time. And I said, well, has anybody ever asked you why you do it? And he said something that was painfully honest. He said, no, they don't care why I do it. They just want me to stop. And I said, well, you know, I don't really care if you stop. And he looked at me. I said, really? Well, I'm not your parent. I'm not your teacher. I'll, I'll never see you again. Uh, that's be between you and the people in your lives on an ongoing basis. But I'm curious. Why do you call out in class? He goes, that's easy. I'm afraid I'm going to forget it if I don't say it. Um, and another kid who... Um, I said, you know, he had a working memory problem. I said, do you ever think of writing stuff down? He looked at me like I was brilliant, um, you know, but another kid was sent to me for moral turpitude because, um, you know, a, a truism about adolescents is that they'd rather act like they don't care than many of them than that they don't know how to do something or that they're having difficulty. Bottom line, every child cares uh, and every child wants to be successful. So this guy, uh, the teacher had very strict rules about note taking. And not only didn't he take notes, but he was provocative in how he didn't take notes. That a typical, you know, as only teenagers can be, he sat with his legs crossed, arm crossed like he was at the beach, um, and didn't write a single thing down. And the teacher would make eye contact with him, point to the board, and he still wouldn't write it, it down. So he walked into my office and I said, so got a question for you. Are you able to focus on what the teacher's saying and write at the same time? He looks at me and goes, Doc, with me, it's one or the other. Bottom line is that, you know, we so often look at a child's behavior from the perspective of how it's affecting the class, what it means to us. The key is getting to understand what that behavior means from that child's perspective and then working from there. Um, and, you know, if a child is acting out, there's a need that is not being met in some form or fashion and identifying that uh, becomes critically important and then the behaviors will, will improve. Uh, but but if you try to stop the behavior before you deeply understand what's causing it, um, then it's you're not going to solve the problem. So, you know, go to your pediatrician, uh, you know, go to the school psychologist. Uh, but that's an absolute reason to begin some kind of an evaluation. You know, the other that's sometimes trickier uh, are the kids that are angels all day in school, but fall apart when they come home. And their behaviors are explosive at home. And these are the kids that have kept it together all day uh, and just can't anymore. You know, their ADHD hasn't been diagnosed. Mm -hmm. um, and so that and, and, and sometimes the school will push back because they're not seeing the problem, but it's a problem. So, you know, think about the behavior as, you know, the tip of the iceberg and look at it as a starting point to say, you know, this behavior is telling us there's something we need to understand and then figure out how we address it. Mm -hmm. well, that's good advice. Yeah. I agree totally. Um, a mom is writing, our son was assessed by an educational psychologist and his working memory, I don't know how this, if this is the right way to frame it, was only 5%. Have you any tips on helping working memory? So, you know, the, um, I would be careful about things you know, the most important question is how is the symptom affecting the child? Um, working memory 5% probably means that he scored in the fifth percentile on the working memory index of the WISC, um, which is how he performed on a couple of tasks. That doesn't necessarily tell you what's going on in school. Oftentimes, you know, working memory challenges may show up um, as the child who can't take notes and listen at the same time. Uh, what is important is uh, a couple of things. One, that uh, 
working on strategies to allow your child to work around limited working memory become important. So the question becomes more importantly, not what is my child's working memory, but how's it affecting him or her in school? Um, can they not do mental math? Uh, are they having difficulty uh, keeping track of, you know, a, a, an example of kids that have trouble with working memory? Um, you know, I, I think back to the computers that we used to have 10 or 15 years ago, and you try to run PowerPoint and Word and Quicken at the same time, and you get the message, you don't have enough RAM to run all those programs. So, you know, kids right. with working memory problems may have trouble spelling in the context of writing a sentence, in the context of writing an essay. So they may need to sort of partition out their work. They may need to use note-taking devices. And then building working memory, um, you know, there is there are um, exercises, you know, there are expensive exercises that, you know, the controversial exercises, uh, and it is un things like CogMed and things that you've heard about. It is unclear whether those tools do build working memory in a way that affects how you do in academic subjects, but things like yoga, physical activity, learning a musical instrument uh, can build working memory, uh, working on activities like building your child's ability to keep increasing numbers of grocery list items in their mind, uh, keeping tasks in their mind. So genuine tasks that work on building working memory uh, can be helpful. Uh, good sleep and good nutrition is also important. And also remember that working memory develops over time. Um, anxiety can impact working memory. Uh, so sometimes lack of working memory can be a symptom of anxiety. So it, it's really sort of looking at the whole picture, figuring out what you can do, how that symptom might be in play right now. What can I do to help my child be successful while that's in play? And then what are the tools that might be used to strengthen that working memory? Okay. Uh, one mom is asking, our child is in private school where we do not have an IEP or 504 plan. We have used accommodations recommended by a psychologist three years ago. Our child is doing well. Should we try to find a way to get an IEP 504 developed? First of all, in a private school, you can't get a 504 plan. The law that gives us 504, which is the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, nobody but me knows what it's called, does not apply to <laughs> private schools. So forget about that. It's possible to get an IEP in a private school should you need one. And I'm going a little more broadly than this specific question. In that case, it's called an IESP, an individualized educational service plan or program. Um, and that assumes that the private school will cooperate. You can, you have the right to get it, but the school doesn't have to cooperate in implementing it. But the question is, if your school is giving accommodations and they're working for your child, then that should be enough. The only time that that comes into play is when your child is seeking to get accommodations on tests like the ACT or SATs. Those are generally arranged through the school. And if your child has been given accommodations, has been using the accommodations, and the school observes that they're helpful to your child, then they will document that to the SAT or ACT people. And that should be fine. I wouldn't go further. If it's not broken, don't fix it. Just, just two, two other you know, caveats. Um, Sometimes private schools, sometimes families will get itinerant services through their school district. That's uh, that IESP. That, that the, that, right, that the school does not provide. So, for example, and but you want to do this in collaboration with your private school, but there are some private schools that, for example, will, will allocate space for uh, somebody from the district to come in and work with the child. Uh, and that would be an opportunity, uh, but that's a conversation that you would have with. The and that would be not a 504 because you can't get it, but the uh, IESP, mm -hmm. the equivalent of the IEP in a private school. Yeah. Um. Mm -hmm. Several parents have just asked as, uh, what do you think of mind maps for students with ADHD? So, 
the term mind maps means different things. So I'm stuck on, on, so mind mapping is a technique for organizing your thinking and organizing your idea, right. um, yeah. which is a wonderful tool. If you're talking about people that mind, that brain map, um, you know, then there's no good evidence that those are useful tools for individual kids. Um, you know, people that do uh, functional imaging and says, this is the part of your brain that's... Yeah, no. Yeah, yeah it, I think they're thinking of the former. The, the, the former. former. So you so find my, it helpful. My maps are really helpful. And I think that, that kids with ADHD oftentimes have difficulty making connections between the big picture and the detail. And, you know, a mind map, you know, things like inspiration software or other tools or graphic organizers, you know, you can use a graphic organizer as a mind map. You know, what's the uh -huh. main idea? What are the supporting details? Because our kids often, you know, need to read the, the chapter twice and read it once for the big ideas and the other for the most salient details. And kids with attention deficit often have difficulty because they gloss over details, they focus on the wrong details, or they don't put the pieces together. And, a, a, you know, a well-constructed strategy using mind mapping can be a very helpful way uh, to create stable uh, representation of information in your child's mind. And then, you know, uh, I've seen people use mind mapping while they're reading, and, and, and then it becomes a tool that can strengthen your writing uh, because you've, or, and also you're studying for an examination where you're thinking about, you've made connections between the details and the main ideas which will be um, create stable memories that are more accessible in your mind. So they, I think they're very useful tools, for, particularly for kids mm -hmm. with ADHD. Mm -hmm. What about tools? I mean, loads of parents have asked, what about tools for time management? Have you run across any kids who just can't either keep track of time or are time blind? Oh, yeah. Experience? <laughs> it, 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 it is hugely, you know, I think having... You know, uh, we, we have a couple of tools, uh, I think, um, in, in our resources. But, you know, the, the way I would think about it is, is um, and, and working with an executive function coach can be incredibly powerful. And that's, not everybody can afford it. But I think that think about the fact that oftentimes kids with attention deficit have difficulty with sequences. They have difficulty, you know, um, we got a call from a patient and uh, the daughter wanted to, didn't understand why she couldn't start baking cookies five minutes before her bedtime. And so for our kids, <laughs> time is negotiable. Um, you know, I, I remember, you know, and, and I would have conversations with one of, one of the girls and I'd say, you know, and she'd get into big fights with the parents because it felt like they were arbitrary in, you know, what do you mean I don't have time to do this? And so we have a sort of buzzword in, in our conversations like, you know, um, laws of time and space. You know, can mom and dad change the, the laws of time and space? No. So is this a time and space thing? But, you know, having a horizontal timeline and sort of listing the things a child needs to do, assigning a time for, you know, a, 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 an estimated amount of time you need for it, and then putting it on the timeline. And don't forget to put into the timeline the things that you don't really want your kid to do, but your kid really wants to do. You know, if you don't put into the kid's timelines the things that they love, then they're going to always feel that they've screwed up or when, you know, well, um, you got on a phone call with your friend, you went on FaceTime, you went on YouTube, um, and suddenly you have an unrealistic expectation. Built those things, the timeline needs to include the big rocks, the things that are important to the child, and built into the timeline the things that your child's value and, you know, figure out how much time they want to allocate to it. And, and sort of looking at a horizontal timeline can be really, you know, really powerful. Like, you know, let's look back. You know, we spent 35% of last night arguing over whether to start your homework. <laughs> you know, is that how we want to <laughs> But we're on, on this planet for a short time. You know, I don't know about you, but I don't want to spend 35% of the, you know, and sort of looking at that in black and white and realizing how long things take, um, you know, and I think a horizontal timeline can be really powerful because it shows how long things take and remember that your child is going to get it wrong. And so, you know, looking back and saying, okay, we had this timeline, but it didn't work. Um, that's not a failure. Uh, a failure is to not use that, you know, that um, incorrect estimate as an opportunity to figure out what went wrong. You know, did things take right. longer than I thought? Did I not, um, did I get distracted? Did I not give myself time for 
a break, you know, for the stuff happens, because um, stuff always happens. Uh, and so, right. you know, using that, I think, can be can be really powerful. Mm -hmm. And we have, you well, know, I, website, the Yellow Center website, has, there's a resources page. And we have a bunch of time management resources there that are free. Um, tools. Some are free, some aren't, but the ones, that we make, the ones that we make are free, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Very good. Well, the hour is up. Thanks so much for being here. It really was excellent. Uh, Our pleasure. Thank you, guys. I really appreciate it. And so does everyone else, I'm sure. So, and thanks to all of the attendees for joining us. <clears throat> and please join us next week when Jerome Schultz will talk about motivating your student with ADHD in school. That ought to be a good one. So make sure you don't miss future Attitude webinars, ADHD expert articles, or important research updates by signing up to receive our free email newsletters at attitudemag.com newsletters. Thanks everyone for being here and have a great day.